We're all reacting accordingly to our triggers. We're all reacting accordingly to what we perceive as threats. And to pathologize someone is to essentially deem their way of being as defective. It's wrong. Or falling beneath the perceived norm. Or wrong. Yeah, simple as that, wrong. Today, we are talking about a specific profile of autism called pathological or pervasive demand avoidance, or PDA. Individuals with this profile can exhibit difficult behaviors at home or school, which are often misunderstood. We are featuring a conversation with Harry J. Thompson, author of The PDA Paradox, The Highs and Lows of My Life on the Little-Known Part of the Autism Spectrum. This is our continued coverage of World Autism Acceptance Month, and episode 121 is straight ahead. I'm Emily Kircher-Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. We're talking today about PDA, and if it's something you've never heard of, you aren't alone. Let's dig in. Harry Thompson, thanks for being here. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. So why don't we start with this? What is pathological demand avoidance or PDA? Pathological demand avoidance is largely accepted as being part of the autism spectrum. So as with other individuals who meet the criteria for autism, Uh, They will exhibit differences in communication, social interaction, and also uh, restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. Um, So what distinguishes PDA from other presentations of autism is, first and foremost, uh, the individual will display a pervasive and extreme tendency to avoid the demands of everyday life. Also, a PDA person will employ social strategies as part of the avoidance. So not just uh, ignoring or fleeing from, say, a request, but uh, using um, social strategies. So coming up with a number of excuses, using delay tactics, etc. Thirdly, the PDA individual has what is described a surface sociability, so appearing sociable and socially driven at first, but perhaps lacking depth in understanding, Um, impulsivity, and emotional lability, and having a tendency to withdraw into fantasy uh, and to engage in role play, and finally, forming obsessions which are often directed at people rather than things. And the diagnostic ratio is even. So boys and girls or males and females are just as likely to be diagnosed as each other, unlike with ASD, uh, where males are up to four and a half times more likely to be diagnosed. I know that PDA is being discussed a lot more where you are in the UK, much more than it is here in the United States. Yes. When did the concept surface and and when did people really start talking about it? Well, I suppose it goes back um, to the 1980s uh, when Elizabeth Newson, who was a neurodevelopmental psychologist based in Nottingham in the UK, observed children who exhibited traits of autism, similarities, however, traits that also set them apart from other autistic kids, namely resisting the ordinary demands of life. So she published a peer-reviewed study, which currently features in the archives of childhood diseases. And this was back in 2003. The name of the study is called uh, A Necessary Distinction uh, Between uh, the Pervasive Developmental Disorders. So she pioneered the work, I would say, and due to this happening in the UK, I think it's fair to say that the UK are spearheading the PDA movement. You actually have this diagnosis yourself, correct? Yes, that's correct. 
So tell me a little bit about your path to diagnosis. How did that come about for you? Initially, I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was 13, following my, quote, problematic, unquote, behavior within the classroom. Um, A year later, I was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum when I was 14, what was formerly known as Asperger syndrome, Mm -hmm. now not recognized by the DSM as a condition in its own right, or now falls under the umbrella of ASD. Uh, Four years later, um, the same woman who diagnosed me reviewed my case because I thought I was going to give music college a try. And my mentor, with whom I was living at the time, uh, got in touch with the speech and language therapist who originally diagnosed me as being on the autism spectrum. So my diagnosis was reviewed and updated to uh, a PDA profile because it would be no use if I were to attend an institution and they were implementing uh, strategies which are often used for autistic kids right. to ensure that uh, the teachers would adopt a more flexible and collaborative approach to educating me. So that's my diagnostic history. I see a lot of kids who have been diagnosed with ASD but were originally diagnosed with ADHD. For you, was that a missed diagnosis or would you say that it is concurrent? I'd say concurrent. I'm I'm very much ADHD. Yeah. Perhaps with the exception of Asperger syndrome, to be honest. I am ADHD and I am autistic with a PDA profile. How accepted is that PDA diagnosis in the UK and Europe? Would you say that it is pretty well understood? Yes and no. Yes and no. It depends on uh, whom you speak to, and it depends on where you live, largely. Um, many clinicians and uh, diagnosticians, pediatricians, speech and language therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, etc., are willing to recognize and diagnose it. Um, however, it still remains a highly controversial topic due to the fact it doesn't feature in either of the Uh, diagnostic manuals, DSM, which you use over there in the States, and the ICD, which we use over here in Europe. Um, So many people will still claim that it doesn't exist, or there are alternative explanations for uh, the behaviours which are part of that constellation. But due to the fact I interact with many people overseas, I think I'm in the position where I can see how, how, how much more difficult it is in other countries, because I, I might tell my UK clients, look, at least here we have a PDA society, at least here there are numerous um, clinicians who are willing to recognise and diagnose it, um, which just isn't the case overseas, at least not to the extent it is here in the UK. So... It's a tricky one because the situation here is not perfect by any means and a lot more work needs to be done. Um, But I suppose if you are a family whose child um, meets this profile and you do live in the UK, you need to be somewhat grateful. That's, That's all I can say. We kind of talked about those symptoms, kind of what those characteristics are like at the very beginning. What does that look like in daily life? I mean... My simple explanation is this is a child who is unbound by human confinements. Mm. That's my um, short uh, description. Um, And that in itself indicates how any type of system uh, or way of life imposed upon this child is going to be met with extreme resistance. So because it's a relatively, I'd say, newly recognized condition. It is thoroughly under-researched, so we don't have prevalence rates. Um, We've got a study which was carried out a couple of years ago as to how many children who have this profile uh, are unable to access school, and that is um, 70% and over, I'd say. Wow. Universally, these kids have problems with school, but perhaps some children might mask at school, then they may be able to hold it together during the school day. But due to the nature of the mask, which, you know, exhausts and drains the person by the end of the school day, when they return home to their kind of safe space, the parents get the brunt of it. So the child 
that the floodgates are open by the time the child returns home and a meltdown is likely to ensue. And the parents report of the child's behavior is often not consistent with the teacher's report of the child's behavior. So the teacher often often places the blame on the parent and saying, well, we don't see this type of behavior at school. The child is relatively well behaved. So these nightmare stories, which you recount at home, must indicate that it's a problem with your parenting. So that's a huge problem. Um, the types of issues you'd see at school would be home, excuse me, at home, would be resisting more or less everything from eating, bedtime, to uh, leaving the house for a, a family outing. Anything you can think of could be a demand. So the child is likely to resist a heck of a lot. You mentioned how kids mask at school. Yeah. I wonder if as kids get older, if that becomes more difficult for them to mask and to appear not to struggle? Well, I suppose it depends. I mean, one could one could also uh, make the claim that the older the child gets, uh, the more efficient they are at navigating the neurotypical world mm. and observing how neurotypical people would conduct themselves in search, certain situations. An autistic or PDA person would find very stressful. So they may hone their masking ability as they continue to develop. Um, and due to the traumatic element involved with the child, quite simply, who is unable to be themselves without repercussions, um, I suppose that would motivate the child to bolster or strengthen the mask as they get older. And the PDA child often has good acting skills, good thespian abilities. Mm -hmm. So masking is quite prevalent and uh, you, you, I say this in my talks, you can have a hundred different reports about a single child and they could all say something slightly different. So, and it's difficult because, I mean, PDA is best understood, according to the literature, as an anxiety driven need to remain in control. Um, and I tell people, try not to get too hung up on the demand avoidance aspect, because then it will make understanding how the child's presentation can differ in school more difficult uh, to grasp. I describe a kind of locus of control whereby the child feels quite safe at home because, you see, when you're PDA, you often scan people. You're scanning people's innermost feelings. So you notice how mum, dad's unconditional love for you is unwavering. And therefore, this provides a sense of safety within an environment such as home. So because it's safe and because there are no costs and because there is no impression in your mind other than mum and dad love me and will not abandon me, the behaviours can take a very extroverted form. You only need to place the child in an environment which isn't so safe, and that anxiety-driven need to remain in control will shift forms. So at school, people don't love you unconditionally, and there are more risks. And therefore, holding it together may be a new control tactic. Mm. I call that inverted control, which is when you lend people in your environment the upper hand in order to probably keep them close or keep things the way they are, not draw attention to yourself because mum and dad don't abandon you. All of these friends at school may do if you act the same way you do at home. So sometimes it's helpful to view it as this hyper control need that can take on different forms. Looking very compliant just so not to rock the boat. Absolutely. The, the compliance is illusory. Mm -hmm. It's likely being driven by a fawn response, uh, the least known of the five Fs, fight, flight, freeze, flop, all of which are self-explanatory, and then fawning, excessive people-pleasing um, as a way of retaining one's safety. Um, and sometimes you have to ask yourself, which behavior is more likely to guarantee my survival? Do I avoid demands here? Will that be safe? Or do I fawn here? Will that be safer? And one may prevail over, over another depending on uh, the context. When I'm talking to my clients and my families about understanding how that all ties in, like you mentioned earlier, it's very anxiety-based mm -hmm. and how that ties in with that ASD diagnosis, mm -hmm. some of the black and white thinking or having difficulty with unexpected transitions or those types of things. I feel like it all kind of ties into that. Yes. And as I've learned about this, I'm like, man, that term pathological 
is such a turnoff, I think. Yes. This is a coping skill. It's it, it's kind of like to make an analogy. Sometimes if I have clients who are using self-injury as a way to deal with anxiety or depression, that is a coping skill. I agree. It's not a healthy coping skill, <laughs> but it is a, you know, it's a way that they're trying to get through that. Sure. It's uh, the word is deeply problematic and there are various attempts to justify its use, uh, such as it's the fact that the demand avoidance uh, is so pervasive and extreme. I mean, mm. some people would much rather refer to it as extreme demand avoidance because many autistics take issue with the fact that non-autistics attempt to uh, pathologize our experiences. So I believe the word pathological is problematic for that reason. It does not acknowledge the mismatch of experience, how the experience of the autistic differs vastly to that of the non-autistic. So I take issue with the language, of course, because from my standpoint, part of it does feel quite reasonable, mm. <laughs> you know, because I suppose I'm detecting threats where another person may not. And um, there's confusion as to what constitutes a threat. Mm -hmm. So from my vantage point, um, I will, uh, I suppose even I'll recognize a threat and I won't go anywhere near it. It's a threat to my uh, level of control, my level of freedom. Anything that is designed to swerve me out of what I call the PDA current has to be discarded. Anything useful can be incorporated into the PDA current. See, I often talk about how there's no such thing as an overreaction. Many parents or teachers might be, uh, might describe the child's meltdown or extreme quote unquote behavior as an overreaction to simple requests without realizing that the child perceives these requests as inherently dangerous and in some aspects is not able to distinguish uh, a minor request from a genuine threat. So there's a mismatch of experience worth acknowledging. And when you acknowledge how the two experiences are different, then the word pathological becomes redundant. Words like overreaction become redundant because mm -hmm. we're all reacting accordingly to our triggers. We're all reacting accordingly to what we perceive as threats. And to pathologize someone is to essentially deem their way of being as defective. Right. It's wrong. Or falling beneath the perceived norm or wrong. Yeah. Simple as that wrong. You know, you mentioned about perceiving those things as threats. Yeah. Would you associate that with some of the, like you mentioned at the very beginning, talking about some of those symptoms with interpreting social situations okay. and appearing to understand them, but not necessarily at a deeper level? Yes. And so would you say that some of that threat is like, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not quite sure what's beneath that mm. or what this means for me? In social situations, as far as the PDA experience is concerned, um, one often finds that the child will, at an intellectual level, get by. So learn the very rudiments of non-autistic interaction as a way of getting by, perhaps even as a way of um, manipulation in some cases for some of these children, as a way of staying one step ahead um, of their interlocutor or primary caregiver or teacher. So, I, you know, difficulties with grasping sarcasm and irony are often noted as, as to the social ability of, of the PDA person. Um, I can recall s struggling with things like that myself as a child. Sometimes I'd probably suddenly fail to recognize sarcasm. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, I would use sarcasm quite fluently <laughs> but when it came to receiving sarcasm it didn't seem to land uh, smoothly inside my brain but i was able to deploy it um and speech and language therapists often pick that up actually where expressive language is quite fluent and uh, apparently able receptive language not so much so i can i can recall that um, as a as a much younger person, um, and I suppose I don't have as many problems with sarcasm now. I'm not sure <laughs> that if that's because I'm older or yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I get it now, and it seems to be a very useful uh, tool and commodity. So I'm grateful that I have it.
like I said, I have several of my clients who just fit this profile so perfectly. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I know that is the most effective way to help them is to just take a collaborative approach to most anything. Absolutely. Or like, hey, this is kind of our goal. What do you think are the best ways for us to work towards that? Or what's going to work for you? Yes. Or if there is a little bit of that pushback, just backing off for a while and then maybe coming back to it when they're more ready, when they indicate that they're ready. Yeah. What you just described sounds like a beautiful experience. <laughs> I'd relish I'd relish that as a, as a child. I'd, I'd relish it now. So a collaborative approach is always very important. Reciprocity and fair exchange is our language. Um, we need to be on the same level as people in order to relate to them. Recognizing authority is uh, of great difficulty to us. It's not so much a rejection of authority. Um, it's more of a, as I said, it's a blindness to it. Mm -hmm. It's a blindness to authority. It's like a pecking order seems to be invisible. So seeing everything as equal, which I think sounds kind of nice. But other people seem to think that's a problematic way to uh, structure society. So there's a, there's it, when a parent or teacher presents an activity which benefits both the PDA child and the teacher or parent, then that's more likely to uh, elicit a positive response from the child. Yeah. There's often this hypersensitivity to separation. So if I feel separate to a person, I'm less likely to trust them and cooperate with them. If I feel they're on my level and if I feel that we can work together towards something, then they're on my level, which means they are visible. The person whom they are becomes visible and therefore I can interact with them. I sense distance between myself and people, which creates this kind of unbridgeable gulf. You mentioned that hierarchy of like authority. Yes. If anybody takes a step back and looks at that, questions just for a moment, why as a society we have these rules about, you know, authority mm -hmm. in the school system or at home or, you know, it's like, well, you do this because I'm the parent mm -hmm. or you do this because I'm the teacher and I told you to do it. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's perhaps neurotypical, we don't question it. Yes. But if we just question it for a second, it's like, well, why is that? Yeah. That doesn't necessarily make sense. Why do we have to do that? And if this is what works for this kiddo, let's do that. Absolutely. We all want autonomy. We all want that sense of of ownership. We do. That's good for all kids, you know. You know what? That's it's interesting you say that because I was um having a debate with someone not so long ago and their argument was at the end of the day all of the PDA friendly strategies would work for all kids. <laughs> right. And I said, "Yes, exactly. I agree with you. <laughs> I think in a sense there's nothing unique to the PDA profile other than less tolerance, in fact, zero tolerance for the uh uh, to put it crudely, bullshit of life, and extremity in presentation. So the extremity in presentation combined with zero tolerance draws our attention to these things that we never really question. And one can't help but realize uh, who really likes being told what to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who wouldn't benefit from a flexible approach to life? So I think that's one of the gifts of PDA, if you ask me. It's a, it's a signal to the rest of the world that perhaps it's time to have a spring clean of the system. So as I was doing some prep work and research about PDA for this interview, I came across some opinions that would be described as, I guess, skeptical, maybe? Yeah, there are. Um, some people who question the diagnosis or say it would be better described as more like burnout or executive dysfunction. I'm curious about what you think about those critiques. Well, of course, um, there are going to be critiques because research is limited. It's all, you know, very, very limited, scarce. So that opens the door for people to swoop down and uh, look at PDA through a more skeptical lens, which I don't mind per se, because at the end of the day, I want to get to the bottom of what this really is. So uh, I will address those two uh, phenomena uh, which you listed, executive dysfunction and burnout. PDA is not burnout and it is not executive dysfunction, though burnout can definitely arise, as can executive dysfunction, to be honest. 
But the demand avoidance of the PDA kind is unique in that it can't really be explained by anything on the outside, which may it, it, there, there's there's there lacks a kind of rational explanation for why demand avoidance occurs. For example, it occurs even when the child or person likes the thing that they do. So I recall a time when I was 18 and I was on a kind of a retreat, let's say, and I take my guitar with me to most places, especially if I'm going to um, stay overnight anywhere. And by the time I was 18, I had some uh, considerable experience in performing uh, publicly uh, with my music. So we were sitting around one day and the kind of organizer of the retreat said, Harry, didn't you bring your guitar? And immediately the anxiety sets in. And I said, yes. And he said, do you think you could uh, bring it over here and play us a song? Um, so my immediate reaction was to not say no, say yes, so that I wouldn't cause a scene. But then I went back to my room and tore the strings off of the guitar. Mm. And even though I'm a, I'm a musician and a guitar player, I have never learned how to restring a guitar. I don't know why, perhaps because I refuse to, but <laughs> I have never bothered learning how to restring a guitar. It doesn't faze me. And I, so I ripped the strings off and then I was unable to use my guitar for the remainder of the retreat. And immediately after doing so, you can't help but feel, why did I do that? What a terrible idea that was. And I wanted to play. I wanted to be able to just do it. Um, because I'd done it many times before and because music is so important to me. And many people might um, say, oh, hang on, is it because you were feeling uh, embarrassed or shy or reserved? And it had nothing to do with that because I had experience in playing. I can remember when I first played, there was an element of shyness there. But maybe within the shyness, there's a demand not to play. Mm -hmm. There's a demand not to play. So then you avoid that and end up playing it. See, demands are all over the place. They're fluid. They're not static. They pop in and out of existence and they can just pop up anywhere in your life. But in order to explain it, it's because I was asked to play. It's because the request violated my sense of who I am. It impinged upon my sense of freedom and control. And if it does that, it has to be avoided at all costs. So... Burnout, demand avoidance following from burnout would imply that the child is exhausted. The child's uh, mental energy reserves are low. And with PDA, it's got nothing to do with that. The child could be willing to um, do anything. The child could be as energized as they've ever felt before. And if a demand is detected, it will be swiftly avoided. So demand avoidance following from burnout is rational demand avoidance. It's a reasonable response to exhaustion. So the demand avoidance of the PDA kind is essentially it's my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. I refuse to compromise my freedom in order to meet your request. And d executive dysfunction, you know, you know, having difficulty with uh, beginning a task, uh, seeing the task through, completing the task, um, running into distractions and, you know, essentially requiring... Uh, a lot of uh, mental energy in order to uh, engage with the task and carry it out. Uh, you can have two kids who refuse to do their homework or don't do their homework, I should say, for completely different reasons. Let's say you have a PDA kid and an ADHD kid. Um, perhaps the ADHD kid doesn't do their homework because maybe they maybe they forget about it. Maybe they bring it home and just forget to do it. Or maybe they sit down to do it. But the amount of stamina and dedication and commitment it would take to focus on the task at hand would be immense. And therefore, the child may lack um, the ability to focus on the task and essentially becomes uh, beset by many, many distractions and they're gradually uh, d dragged away from the task by... Um, distraction and whatever else. The PDA child may not have any of those issues at all. 
uh, ADHD doesn't necessarily have to accompany PDA, though it's often seen in PDA kids. ADHD and PDA often exist together, but it doesn't have to. Maybe the PDA child has no problems with um, lapses in concentration whatsoever. The fact that someone asked them to do it is enough of a reason not to do it. And perhaps they'd struggle to meet their own self-imposed demands. Whether they have the ability to do it or not has no bearing. Perhaps they have the ability to do it and do it so well. Perhaps they have the ability to do it better than anyone in their class. But if it is a demand, if there is a demand to do the homework, it doesn't matter about the child's ability to do the work. It could be far beneath them intellectually, but they will not do it because it is a demand. What advice would you give the student, the child, who is struggling with this? Something maybe that you would have wished that someone would have said to you when you were really kind of going through this as a, young, as a younger uh, individual? Yeah. Um, well, it's difficult to answer because I look back on my experiences and each of them were pivotal, very important in creating the person I am today. But there were many times when, obviously, I could have just done with a friend. I could have just done with someone who was willing to understand me. Maybe they wouldn't have understood me immediately, but who was just willing to understand me. In my book, I talk about how I went to a home from home schooling organization, a woman an ex-headmistress, an ex-principal, I should say, for American audiences, um, ran a school from within her farmhouse, um, ideally for kids who didn't quite fit the system. And she accepted the fact that I found life difficult. I suppose because I was um, uh, perhaps what you'd call a gifted academically, teachers and family members always thought that my behaviour arose from perhaps laziness, stubbornness, um, unwilling to cooperate, blah, blah, blah. But she just saw right through that and said, I can see that you have problems with life. And that was the biggest compliment anyone had ever given me. Hmm. Um, And it was so important to have someone who really acknowledged me. So community is so important. Um, If these kids just have one friend who gets them, that's so important to have. But as to uh, relating it to their future, Sometimes it's helpful to see the demand avoidance as a guide through life. I describe, I've got a you know little uh, concept I have right now, a little metaphor I call the PDA current. And I always have to ask myself, am I inside the current? Inside the current, I can flow smoothly through life and everything is possible. And that is my identity. You know, this obviously this role I have now, I don't call it a job or a career or anything like that because that will jinx it <laughs> and I won't be able to do it. So whatever I do now is just a lifestyle that is in total and blissful harmony with my brain chemistry. So it's it's asking oneself, and I, I would have asked myself, I would have noticed this as a child. Occasionally, I found that I could do things when I was able to do them myself without any pressure and I could define the terms in my life. That was me being inside the flow. So... I still ask myself that now. Am I in the flow? Am I out the flow? When I'm out the flow, I run into old habits, let's say. And I have to I have to say, okay, how do I get... Every time the child avoids a demand, every time they carry out an extreme impulse, it's essentially a knee-jerk reaction. It's an attempt to steer themselves back into the flow, back into their autonomy, back into who they really are. And resisting everything and rejecting everything is part of rejecting things which fall outside the flow because you're hypersensitive to a way of life other people want you to take. School? No, that seems absurd. That seems ridiculous. That does not resonate. So having that kind of helpful metaphor has really aided me. You've found a way to make it work. Yeah, for now. Yeah. I don't like speaking in absolutes because anything could jinx anything. You know, it's I'm on a knife edge all the time. <laughs> Yeah. I'm tightrope walking. Yeah. I'm tightrope walking. I'm just really hopeful that this conversation will help people understand what is going on inside our kids just a little bit more. You and me both. You and me both. Harry Thompson, author of The PDA Paradox. Thanks for the chat. Hey, I loved it. Demand avoidance is a very real and a very misunderstood occurrence. 
Not all autistic people experience demand avoidance, but for those who do, it can lead to unnecessary and inappropriate discipline, academic underachievement, and learned helplessness. If there's one thing I would urge you to focus on when you're communicating with someone who experiences demand avoidance, it is to focus on the relationship, validate their experiences and emotions. Give them the benefit of the doubt that they aren't being difficult for the sake of being difficult and ask them to help you find the solutions that will work. If you start with a relationship based on trust, you can help to greatly reduce the anxiety of someone with PDA, and that will help them feel safe when they're with you. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. How come the sky sometimes hides behind the clouds? Maybe it's just like me, a little bit scared of heights. Why does the rain always keep on pouring down when it's gray outside? It really makes me wonder. Thank you to Harry J. Thompson for being a guest on this podcast. This is our continuing coverage of World Autism Acceptance Month 2022. Thank you for listening. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. The executive producer and post-production editor is me, Dave Morris. More episodes ahead for Autism Acceptance Month, so check your podcast feed all during the month of April. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This podcast is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.